Okay, what's up, Road Brothers? This is Steven from Phantology, and I have Ben, Josh, and Ryan, four of us this time, actually a pretty, pretty big crew here, to talk about the first book of the Broken Empire trilogy by Mark Lawrence, entitled The Prince of Thorns, or just Prince of Thorns. And Ryan is, I guess, he's not, he's not a Mark Lawrence expert, but he is more read than us. Uh, myself and Ben and Josh have only read this first Lawrence book. So it should be an interesting conversation there. If you've read Lawrence, if you read this book, you know, there's uh, some interesting points to touch on here as this is a very dark and very unique book, at least uh, thus far in what I've read in fantasy. So how should we get started here? Should we just like throw it out there? Do we, <laughs> do we like Jorg? Is Jorg a, a person that we can get behind? <laughs> Well, I mean, I feel like we might be moving into kind of spoilers. Yeah. Should we do it like um, a little non-spoiler section or? All right. Yeah. Okay. If you haven't read, if you haven't read the series, what can people expect from Prince okay, of Okay. Well, I will describe it the way that Ryan described it to me when he was trying to convince me to read it. And it might be a little spoilery, but he said, Ben, you might like this book. It has a very hard protagonist to like, like you see him commit um, violent acts of murder and rape in the first scene and then you're kind of forced to try and like him after that and so that's the way it was described to me um, by fellow Phantology member Ryan I actually don't remember saying that uh, so either you imagined it or I forgot it no way well, we were we were chatting in the hot tub man you're like you should read this book okay well <laughs> I, so I think I think to answer Stephen's question, you can like Jorg for what he is. You don't have to think he's a good person, but I, even even though he, he is definitely not your stereotypical hero. In fact, he's probably the opposite of that. You uh, or I would find myself cheering for him throughout it. I don't know if that necessarily meant I liked Jorg, but I liked I liked reading his story, seeing where he went. I have a feeling we're gonna I, we're gonna have a good conversation about this book because these are a lot of good, you know, good takes that I don't agree with necessarily. <laughs> okay, um, we got a strong anti jorg let, Let's uh, let me just circle back real quick. So okay. I have to uh, issue an official apology to Ryan because Ryan's been trying to get me to read this book for a while. Sounds like Ben, he's also been working on you, maybe you as well, Josh. And, no, I'm uh, actually offended right now because Ryan hasn't <laughs> talked to me about this. Okay. Book series. Well, Actually, wait, it's, maybe I shouldn't be offended because <laughs> maybe Ryan knows Maybe Ryan just knows your taste. <laughs> yeah. So it's been a while for me, at least. And Ryan, and I apologize because, and maybe as part of our non-spoiler review, we should say, I really liked this book. Like, I feel like I'd been in a rut for a little bit where I hadn't read anything that I was super excited about. But this was one that I read really quickly and I kind of I kind of binged through because it's very exciting. And there are a lot of interesting things to try to wrap your mind around the writing. I thought it was just fantastic. It's not overly complex. You can just like read right through it. So I'm excited to read the rest of the series. And I apologize, Ryan, because I obviously should have read Prince of Thorns sooner. Well, I'm going to be the beggar man and I will accept your apology. <laughs> and uh, I will just uh, say for myself, this was actually my second time reading through the Broken Empire trilogy. I read it a few years ago and I wanted to get into more of Mark Lawrence's work. So I decided to read it again and I enjoyed it maybe more the second time because I could connect things a little bit better, I think. Uh, mm. And and so I, after I finished, I've continued on to read his other work. So maybe maybe we'll talk about those at a future time. But it's it's a very good series. I think it appeals to a lot of people, adults, but definitely not everybody for some very obvious reasons. Which leads me to my question. Um, so two part question. First, who would you recommend this book to? Second, when in somebody's reading journey, would you recommend this book? Are you or like asking what, what on level the on the yeah. iceberg? Yeah, on the iceberg. So, so two part question for you guys. Yeah, so I, I did a video, well, Phantology collaborated to do this video where we put together Big Iceberg. It's a, it's a popular internet meme right now. And on each level of the iceberg, there are different layers of 
authors and works, et cetera. So Josh is asking kind of like, where does this fall in your, in your fantasy reading journey? I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, Mark Lawrence is a pretty big name. I yeah. think at least he's yeah, he getting is. bigger, you know? Um, I mean, he's not like George R. R. Martin, Brandon Sanderson, Patrick Rothfuss, but he's like, he'll be up there. I think in the next five to 10 years, if he keeps on going the way he has been. So I don't know if like, depending on that, like I could see honestly him being one of the first authors that you read in fantasy. And so, and I think this was one of his first books. Right. And so I would say this could be pretty close to the start. I mean, assuming that you like his grim darky style. Yeah. But it's, it's, I mean, maybe you could come across it at the start, but is that where you would like recommend someone start reading fantasy? Well, it's also a shorter book, right? Like, I mean, yes. so you're not like handing somebody a thousand page book with 10 true, books in true. the series. I think Josh that, is not liking these days. <laughs> I think that you recommend it to somebody who's already a fan of the genre and obviously mm-hmm. somebody who's an adult. I don't think you should recommend this to somebody who's in their their early teenage years it's it's got right. very very <laughs> this poignant. is not what a typical 13 year old should be doing <laughs> it's, it's got very uh poignant <laughs> aspects of morality to it as such that you, you almost might need to set aside morality when you're reading it <laughs> and i i think that honestly some people they they can't get in the mind of jorg because they're unable to to set aside their morality in in this while reading it i'm not not saying i'm not saying yeah you i'm not saying you become a sociopath (laughs) yourself obviously but i think that you whenever you read fantasy especially when you're following heroes who don't have uh, who have a grayer sense of morality who are okay Mm -hmm. with killing you need to set aside a, a, a certain amount of morality in order to empathize with them and to cheer for them and Jorg, you it, it's a, a lot that you need to set aside to, yeah to set yeah. aside for, for I, I guess that's the best way i know how to say it and that's not going to be everybody nor do i think it should be everybody so oh sorry real fast ryan you said something near the start there that for fans of the genre so i just got done reading a couple stephen king books and he's not like he's not like fantasy fantasy but like I was like, I just got done reading Pet Cemetery. I think if you read Pet Cemetery, you could handle this book. You know what I mean? So I don't like, you'd probably have to be a like fantasy adjacent fan at least. Do you know what I mean? But like, this could be like somebody's first fantasy book in my opinion. Like as long as you've kind of already exposed yourself to like other material mm-hmm. that's on the same level of like- You have to just... be okay with the darkness. So, yeah. Okay. So let me, let me answer my own question a little bit. From my perspective josh hated the book <laughs> no no i did not but okay so here's here's the thing is i don't know if it's just me but i felt like this book is like always pushed on the library apps like whenever i kind of go to like the fantasy section of like libby or whatever it's always like on there it's always like i feel like it's always recommended on amazon whenever i'm like on a book the top recommended book is always like prince of thorns and i've I see it just floating around a lot, right? Like so, um, so marketing is really good. So marketing, I feel like this book is everywhere. I feel like if you were like, oh, um, maybe you just download Libby and you're like, oh, this book has suggested to me. Hmm, why don't I check it out? Then okay. I feel like you could be really turned off by like the genre, by the grim dark genre as a whole. Like you'd be like, this is way too much. I don't want to read about, you know this this these characters doing x y and z in the first chapter um and so i guess it's not a problem so much with the book although i i do have some problems with the book but i feel like if somebody were just to stumble upon this book without being ready for it then it would be pretty it could just turn them off from reading fantasy and grim dark fantasy in general which would be really sad and grim dark which would also be sad um I also feel like there's just so many better, like I feel like Joe Abercrombie, it just does the style of book and a lot better. So I feel like somebody I would. They're different though. Well, they are, but they, but I feel like they're different kind of, yes, they are. 
Like this is way more intense than Joe Abercrombie. But also just the structure yeah. and the style of story that's being told where Jorg is the first person the protagonist, yeah. at least, at least through the first book, like it's somewhat of a hero's journey tale, right? Like you've got a, a prince who's kicked out and he's seeking vengeance. And, and I, I think we're going to have some tropes of versions later in the series, but you yeah. right away in Joe Abercrombie, you get that it's not that it's this larger cast of characters. I, and I guess. Well, I think, I think that the second, we don't want to get into spoilers, but I think that this is more like uh, maybe the second trilogy and like, it's a little bit more like that with a little bit more um, tighter cast of characters and more plot centered. But I think that Josh, to your, to your point, uh, you can, anybody who reads this, who would get turned off of fantasy, I think isn't necessarily doing the research because it, any reviews of this book you're going to find people who have that view who read it and and instantly get turned off of it because to mark lawrence's credit he puts it in the very beginning so people who yeah. aren't going to stomach that they're going to read the first few chapters and and be like this book's not for me and they're going to put it down yeah mm-hmm. yeah i i get i get, so i'm just picturing myself like um like five, six years ago in like 2015, I was looking to start getting into Grimdark and I was thinking about either reading Prince of Thorns or Half a War by Joe Abercrombie, like Joe Abercrombie's other like kind of Viking series. Yeah. And I picked up, I started reading Half a War instead. I feel like if I would have just picked, and it wasn't because like I read the reviews, it was just kind of like I was flipping through trying to find a good book to read. And I feel uh-huh. like if I would have read Prince of Thorns instead of Half a War, I would have just like, not gotten into the genre at all so you're more corrupted now <laughs> i maybe or i've just like i kind of I, I don't know i honestly i feel like if i wasn't reading it for phantology i probably wouldn't have finished the book that's okay wait okay so okay. before because i feel like we're about ready to get into spoilers but i wanted to bring up something i learned about mark lawrence for this i so this is like just about him as a person he do you guys know that he has a degree in physics and a PhD in mathematics. Is that pretty not. crazy? I, I knew yeah. that. I think in his bio, he says he has like top secret security clearance in both the US and the UK. Yeah. Something yeah. along those lines. Apparently so, he's like done like research for like high levels of government. So, so he's a builder for real. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I guess so. Um, and yeah, so he's just, I, I think he's a pretty remarkable guy. I think he started like, writing kind of later on in life you know maybe like after his career um maybe like midlife crisis type thing i don't know but yeah it's obviously i I feel that so i feel that (laughs) steven like four years into his career he's like all right it's time to to i can't do this anymore (laughs) another thing about mark lawrence he is a friend of the friends talking fantasy show i think they've i don't know that, that they've had him on but he has answered like some of their questions in pretty good detail and they've covered a lot of his books. So um, check out, definitely check out Friends Talking Fantasy if you're a fan of Mark Lawrence. They've covered his books way more than we have. Uh, maybe we'll have them on the show sometime. Yeah. Ryan might defect over to their podcast. What? <laughs> I'm not a friend of theirs. I mean, I, I, I would be, but it's, it seems like an exclusive group. <laughs> All right, so should we get into spoilers now? I mean, maybe we kind of yeah, talked yeah. around it a little bit. Yeah, okay, okay. So Josh said he almost didn't finish. I said I really liked it and I'm looking forward to more. And I probably would have kept it going if not for, um, I started The Last Argument of Kings by Joe Abercrombie. So I'm in a real big grimdark kick because I'm trying to reread that one. Anyway, um, so those are two different opinions, two different ends of the spectrum. Ryan's read it twice. Ben, where do you fall kind of in, in between all of our ratings? So I liked it, but I, like, I think I skim read it probably like, I think uh, I skim read it probably. <laughs> well, I didn't think I had skim, skim read it, but after talking to Josh, um, I didn't pick up like on a lot of the <laughs> smaller details. So a typical things. Ben read of a book. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I can, man. But like, <laughs> I, I enjoyed it for the way I consumed it. I, I, uh, I really enjoyed it. So I don't All know. Right. I kind of had going into it that I didn't need to like 
pay close attention to like the minute details of the book, which I think for the most part is true. So maybe I mean there is some there's some foreshadowing there. By the end, you realize some stuff's been going on throughout. All right, so maybe we'll fill in Ben with some details <laughs> as the podcast goes on. Uh, yeah, so I w- yeah, I would say I enjoyed it though. I would not have Josh's same opinion. Okay. Okay. Can I can I clarify my opinion a little no, bit? You can't. You've had your chance. You just have to be a spectator for the rest of the. You, you can you can indeed clarify your opinion. Yes. So I don't know if I would have finished it, but I'm glad I did. Okay. I think I would have probably stopped about a third of the way through. I feel like it started getting really good, probably um, when he goes and nukes the city. I, that's I when really, I started liking it. That's when it gets good, huh? I thought it got really good once we went back to court. I really liked the court politics. The court politics was so shallow. Yeah. It was, it was good enough. What, do, for what me. do you mean? How was it good? It was like he's a obsessed hate with triangle. His, he's obsessed. Yeah. He's uh, he gets infatuated like a 14-year-old boy would with his with his hot uh with stepsister. Aunt, no aunt. Step aunt. aunt. And step, not step not aunt. related. Not related. Not, it's not, not related. related. But he gets no, but definitely with, the start of a lot of uh a lot of other literature out there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, I mean, come on. And then, and then he say goes. It, you say it's shallow, but it's shallow. like, but how? This is this is a sub ten hour book. You can't delve into the nitty gritties of court politics. It's a, yeah, is, it's not this, as deep as Song of Ice and Fire, but there's a lot for what this what is there is. Jorg telling his own story, so he's telling you the the most important parts to his story. He's not gonna he's not gonna tell. Oh, and then my father twitched his cheek and the court jester took that as some cue for <laughs> it, it. It's not that. And, and that's not the story. And, and I think that this for what it is, is really good. It's just fast paced. Things happen. Oh, page after page after page. It's you're not, you're not getting bogged down in these small details. Well, I think to Josh's point, I think that the level of uh, commitment that he, I don't know. I can't even remember, remember her name. What's her name? Like, Catherine. 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 <laughs> the level of commitment that he had towards Catherine was kind of ridiculous for like how much we saw him interact with her. Like when he was watching his best friend slash father figure, when he was forced to kill him, he was like, this is like, I would be like, he kind of had Catherine up on like the other person who'd have to kill in order to like uh, have no strings, like no, nothing attaching him anymore. You know, like. You're talking um, about when he had to kill the Newbin? Newman. Yeah. Yeah. I think he so, does make that comparison, yeah. Yeah, he was, so in my mind, I'm like, why Why do you feel that strongly toward her? Like, well, this is no also a, a very young teen boy who lost his mother in a traumatic accident. Well, not an accident. She was murdered along with his brother. So he obviously has issues and he mm-hmm. hasn't been around. As soon as he gets back to court, suddenly there's this noble woman who's around his same age who's introduced to maybe she could fulfill the mommy issue so now you're thinking his step aunt slash mommy issue figure that's that's even more creepy there's another so there's another thing with her um and this is maybe getting into theories of what i think uh, might happen later on in the series but so when when corian who's the pagan um advisor to count renar who's been influencing him right if you go back and look through the parts where he influences jorg the most are parts where catherine's around and he's like, you need to kill her. You need to cut the strings there. So for some reason, that's important enough for Corian to, to do that, for that to be like such a strong thing. And I, after reading the first book, I really don't know why, even like what Corian was trying to do or why Jorg was the one or, or even why Catherine then was a, such a source of influence. But there may have been some like kind of subtle things pressing on Jorg to, to really make it her important. So maybe, are you saying like Cor- Corian might have been exuding his influence to maybe like make him feel like he cared even more than he did to try and kill her? Because maybe like if they did get together, there would be like a threat to his... Something like that. Yeah, I really don't know what it is, but there's some extra significance to her in Corian's scheming. But he's dead now, so who knows? Wait, so you think that she was in on it with Corian? No, no, no. 
I think that okay. Corian wants to get rid of her for some reason. Oh, got it, got it. But we don't yeah, even know yeah. what Corian's trying to do, and Corian's dead now. So I'm guessing that's second and third book stuff. That there's got to be a, an explanation there. That's the detailed read, Ben. That's the so. Hey, I was able to keep okay. up with that. All okay, right. okay. <laughs> let, let me kind of come back to my uh, my issues with the court politics. Yeah, because yeah. We we got we got away from that conversation. It's it's a bigger issue in the fact that you don't know what anybody's motivations are besides Jorg's. And even Jorg's motivations are like, get switched up pretty drastically um, half or two thirds of the way through. Uh, and I don't so, know. I, okay. Yeah. So, so there's no uh, real um, independence or autonomy in any secondary character really in the band. Like a little bit with Macon, who I really liked, but he's the only one that had like any real, uh, you know. Oh yeah, the rest of the brothers are just the, the rest of the brothers. So and then Nugent, so, Nugent, Nugen, Nugen, Nugen. kind of, but Nubin, but he kind of just he he didn't really say a whole lot, and when he did, he it did, was just gosh, his eyes said it all. All right, right, <laughs> fine. But my point is, is that there is no other part of the story. And Ryan, you can like I agree with you that it was first person. So the one we really do need to care about is Jorg and it was done really well, but there's nothing else to really care about in the book because everything else is so shallow. And I get your point that that is just coming from, because it's a first person point and it's coming from Jorg's perspective. And so, and maybe you having read like the other trilogy that follows other characters, like, you know, you're, you might be seeing a bigger picture than I am, but that was like a pretty big, complaint I had for the book was that we got George's perspective and there didn't feel like there was a big enough backdrop for me to really care about what he was doing. Do you feel like in other first person books, we're not going to do spoilers, but let's just kind of like broadly compare it to two examples, Dresden Files and Name of the Wind, two other first person books, pretty popular. Do you feel like in those books, the characters are fleshed out enough where you do see those so, competing so motivations? It is hard because there's the page counts are so different for them. Name of the Wind, we have what, a th- around 950 pages, 1,000 yeah, pages? two books. They're both like 800 to 1,000, yeah. So, so, and then Dresden, I don't know. Like if we were just to compare the first Dresden book to this book, they're probably around, maybe Dresden's a little bit shorter. So that's a good point. Mm-hmm. But it, I will uh, say, I yeah. will say that uh, Dresden does a really good job of having very distinct characters, right? Like, like, you got, you know, the main yeah. protagonist, but then you also have like the short spiking co- cop, the uh, Chicago uh-huh. gangster. So it's much more like less amorphous characters compared to this book. Yeah, I That's can see that point. criticism. There, there were a lot of characters who kind of, kind of blended together. There's the tutor and the priest and that it's like, yeah, how different are they really? Other than Macon and and Reich, I don't even, know. If- even Reich wasn't that compelling for me and it's not like the king was very original he was just kind of like an old spiteful man and his you know like who didn't care about anything but the kingdom like there wasn't that much depth to any of the yeah i I guess the court politics that i like were maybe more of the action of the court politics like when he goes and he subverts the duel and he pulls down the, the glass tree and he shoots the uh whatever that was captain of the guards in the face with the crossbow like that was pretty sweet and that, then that, when he gets that, stabbed at the end, like that was really surprising and also exciting. Those moments were good. That, that, that scene was really cool, but I think it would have been so much better if you would have just spent, like you don't need a lot of page time for it, but you can spend a little bit of time reminiscing about how, oh, it was, this guy taught me everything I know about swordplay or whatever. And now Macon's going up to fight him. Like if there just had been he a did little- do that. He said that Macon was like the best that a, he's ever a seen. Bit. Yeah. Uh, but like you've never seen anybody top making and you know, so like, you, right, you want lose. you want more backstory chapters but it when, sounds like. not even cha- just you can you can have a little bit more like um stake stakes to when this is going on at the court like how big of a deal is it that making is fighting this guy how like um is this I don't guy think actually it was that big of a deal though like well so then he's important find- to jorg which is why jorg interfered but like they're just two captains of the king's guard. Like it's not like they have any like international importance here. 
Kind, kind of, but I'm, fit, I'm picturing like Game of Thrones. You get Jamie dueling with, uh, I'm forgetting the one of the other king. Like, well, I mean, maybe we don't say spoilers for. Sorry, but uh, anyway, okay. Anyway. There's duels Josh happening in Game of Thrones. Wanted to. <laughs> anyway. So, I think it said at least two or three times in this book. Like, literally, it said the phrase "playing the Game of Thrones," trying to win the Game of Thrones. So, yeah sacrifice my knight sacrifice my pawn uh-huh, whatever uh-huh. yeah playing in chess which it was cool to figure out like where he learned that from right like that like n- phrase was like incepted into his mind by at least that's the reading i got from it you guys are looking at me like i'm crazy by so. Corian. i don't oh, sorry yeah Lost power one second so i feel like i want more in the second and third books about Corian because that's such an important thing by the end of the book, but you don't even know who the dude is until like 75% through. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, this guy has been controlling Jorg for, for years here. And now I've got to go take him down happens very fast. And it's introduced mm-hmm. very briefly. And I, that's a criticism I could, I can definitely get behind like for the big kind of basically the big bad of the, the real big bad right? You think it's Count Renner the whole time, but it's really this advisor. For that to be the thing for this book comes in really late, doesn't seem all that important until it's already happened. So I wish that was more fleshed out. So um, just going back to who Jorg is, he's, uh, I, I mentioned before, he's a young teenage boy who lost his mom and brother in a violent murder. And his father, how does his father respond? He just makes a deal with the mm-hmm. Count of Renar for, I, I don't know, some land. and it's Like a some, few horses and trading horses. rights. And... And, and so that's that's what Jorg sees in the last, uh, in his father. That's that's what his father is placing above the lives of his his mom. And so Jorg, yeah. is, Jorg is following Sue, where that's pretty much kind of what matters to Jorg I know that vengeance has vengeance is kind of his first pursuit but Corian puts that in back and we do know that Corian is playing Jorg kind of like a pawn so I think Ben does does also have a point where he's saying that Corian is probably removing Renner as the emphasis of Jorg's mind and putting these uh these motivations for the the kingdom and the empire beyond more at the forefront of his mind. For Jork's character, I really liked a conversation that he had with this random knight that he captured, Sir Renton. Uh, this dude is like, why do you think you're special, Jork? Because a lot of people have had family mm-hmm. die, right? Like what, what makes you so special? What makes you above all of this? And Jorg is like, I'm the best at vengeance. Other people yeah. are really good at shooting arrows, but I'm like the best Avenger possible out there. And then I think Macon says, why don't you let this guy go and kind of stop the cycle of killing? And Jorg says, well, actually, no, the only way to really win is just kill everyone and everyone that could possibly kill me. And then I'll stop the cycle. So I thought that whole sequence is like one chapter. I thought that really, and it was towards yeah. the beginning that really kind of set the the stage of what Jorg's persona was as a young kid. And like Ryan said, this is obviously coming from what happened to him as a kid and what he's seen as father value. Yeah. You guys I, are just Jorg apologists. <laughs> I, I don't, Jorg I mean, did nothing wrong. Uh, we're, I guess we're, we're trying to explain, explain his behavior, but I hope this doesn't seem like we're trying to say that what he did was was right. Uh, yeah, right? he's done a lot of awful things. Yeah, we're not trying to. There, there's there's no expl- there's no letting that go. Even though Jorg is like, well, I don't really care, and I'm not going to beg for forgiveness. We're not going to forgive him either. So, yeah, so- here, here's a conversation I wanted to have with you guys. Do you need like? Um, do you need your protagonist to get better? Have an arc where they like? I get that Jorg's an anti-hero, um, but just because like there are there are people that are bad people in fantasy, 
that slowly mm-hmm. get redeemed or at least have arcs where they grow. Yeah. And throughout the first book, Jork didn't. Like he maybe got to where the point where he was like, oh, I'll go put this guy out of his misery instead of torturing him. Like that's maybe the most of an arc we got. Well, he did say he him. wouldn't. He's like, if I look back on what I did, I don't feel bad about it, but I wouldn't do it again. Yeah. What does that mean? I mean, that just means like, he, 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 he might not go yeah. like rape and burn a village, but he doesn't feel bad that he did do it because it like got him yeah. to where he is now. Yeah. So now at this point, he doesn't have to do that anymore, but he doesn't regret doing it because it's got him to, to king level. That's how I you know, took it. I don't know. Ryan, what do you think about that? Do you... Well, I, I think, well, to answer Josh's question, yes, I think he needs some growth in order for a book to be enjoyable, at least for me. And for Jorg, I think that his growth is since he's an anti-hero, his growth is different from the type of growth you see with your typical heroes. It's, it's not the story where you see an anti-hero become a hero. So, okay. Can we, I know, can we do some comparisons to Jamie from uh, Song of Ice and Fire? As long as they're not spoilery. (laughs) I guess, I mean, people have seen it right. If you haven't seen I, I'm specifically talking about this show. So let's just... Okay, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones, I mean, yeah, the books haven't really got to that point a ton. Yeah, so, so I, if you're not yeah. familiar with George R. R. Martin's Westeros, maybe yeah, tune out for a second. Want to be. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, well, yeah. So tune out for a second. Get, Jamie was very interesting to me because he starts off pretty much as bad as George. Like his first main action is to have sex with his sister and then push a kid out a window. Right. Like yeah. that's, that's pretty bad, but then you slowly get to, it's not that you find more out about him that justifies his actions. Although that does happen a little bit. You find out that like he has been seen as this major villain, but in reality, mm-hmm. he was like saving all of King's landing, but then you would see him treating people with respect. You see him treating Tyrion with respect. You see him uh, uh, treating Bri- uh, Bran? Bran. Bran with yeah. respect. Like you see all these things and even like, Catelyn who was like treating him really terribly like you see him even like respect her right some he does have some honor so some some sometimes. right and and so he has this arc where it's not just you finding out about his backstory redeems him it's the fact that he stays consistent with his character but he ha- he does enough good things that you start to like care for him a little bit he seems um, like a real person who has sides exactly bad and good to them right same thing with uh, a lot of characters in um, in Abercrombie's book, right? Like none oh, yeah. of them are good, all the way good or all the way bad. But I would say that Jamie stays mostly on the kind of like villain side, except for when he's good, right? Uh-huh. And so I just, I I think that my issues with, uh, with this book is that you don't get enough good to like even have you care at all about Jork's like progression. But the thing is, he's not progressing morally. All that you're talking about is, is is Jamie's moral compass. But he does do more and more awesome things that make you like him more and more. Well, well, this is another criticism: is that he's just such a Mary Sue that he like literally can't do yeah, anything wrong. That is one thing I wanted to bring up, and maybe should we wrap this first discussion and then talk about his yeah, George? Let's, yeah, let's let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jake put a timestamp in right here telling people that they can come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're right, Josh. There's, at least in this book, there's no moral progression. And maybe it would have been served to see him like put someone out of his misery instead of torture them. Or I don't well, we know. Do, like, we do see him do that at the ending with the king, like down in the dungeon, right? He says that he's going to like go kill him instead of torturing him. You don't know if he did that. Uh, I don't think he says that. He says that he begs for it every day, but he's not gonna do no. it. He contemplates okay. it, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He at but least thinks like about the, it. Even like the children that he ends up rescuing, he doesn't care about them. They're all pawns to him. Yeah. Even like Macon, you know, his his friend and, and real father figure. When he when Jorg is pretty much dead, he comes back to life and he goes down to the prison to rescue him. And he's like, oh, dang, Macon's injured. He's not going to make it. 
well, yeah. you know, too bad. Well, no, didn't he like try and kill? Wasn't I, I got con- a little bit confused? Wasn't he going to try and kill Macon and then making he like, contemplates him out? he contemplates yeah. killing him, but I mean, I yeah, he, they they do get in a fight. Yeah, he like reached for his sword and went to kill Macon. Yeah, so he shuts him. He they they get into a fight. I think they get separated for a second, and then George's like, "I'm just gonna leave him." And then turns out Macon is okay enough to follow him along. So yeah, that's all disappointing. You think like maybe he has enough humanity at least to recognize the people that have helped him in his endeavors. All these endeavors have been evil. Like maybe this guy's at least like someone that I can rely on. Yeah, I think he's got about enough humanity to recognize that the things he does are wrong. Not it, necessarily enough to, to feel bad as, about it. Yeah. So maybe he's not like a straight up psychopath. Like he does have some, he does recognize that what he's doing yeah. is not right. But you know just, the definition of a psychopath, they can recognize that maybe it's wrong, but they don't feel bad about it. Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to miss. Sh- sh- yeah. I don't want to like uh, either yeah. shame any, like, I don't know. Yeah. That's, Throwing around those terms is always a little bit sketchy, but he Jorg is a bad person. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, man. This is why I just struggled with the book is because I could never. That's the point though. That's the reason why, you know, is a good book is because you had these struggles of if you are going to like this character or not. But I think Josh is saying yes. he could have appreciated it more if at least there was some like redeeming or not even redeeming, but just like shred of humanity to the guy. <laughs> or yeah. Or some, this is some, some moral like code, it. even if the more, okay, so here's the thing. Like, even if he has some moral code, even if it's not like a standard moral code or like one that I would agree with at all, but he doesn't have anything. It's not even like, you know what I, I mean? mean He's got a moral code to the point that, like, he wants to win and will do anything to, to get there. Yeah, exactly. He not he self sabotages himself sometimes. Like with like what with what you're saying about Macon. Like, obviously, Macon is one of his most loyal people. It would have been better for him had he like tried to rescue Macon, but he just like doesn't care. He it yeah, it does seem weird that he wouldn't like investigate to like okay, like are you really okay? Like, could you if we sat here for a day, could you make it out? But Instead, he's just like, eh, well, you and know, I guess he he's say, a, yeah, I guess he's like a 14 year old kid. So you can just say, well, he's just impulsive and reckless. And that's how 14 year olds are, which is definitely impulsive and reckless. Yeah. I don't know. Right. Okay. I'm just going to say I, I need some pushback. Yeah. His character. Have, have any of you guys watched Killing Eve? Oh, no. I watched a few episodes of it. There's like an assassin, like one of the two main characters that reminds me a lot of Jordan. I don't know. Like, just yeah, but at, le- at least she has like, she has a reason for why she's doing things, and George does too. I don't know. That's a good point. Good comparison. All right. I was. I, I, was, I, I was compelled. I was compelled enough by just like wanting George to win because I thought his cause was like somewhat oh justified in that you know he was he was screwed over as a kid and his family's been killed and his father just tried to kill him and like. Now he's trying to make his way in this awful world, like, and you're following him. And I feel like anytime you get inside someone's head enough, you can just kind of hope that they do well. And he was cool and winning and doing awesome things. So like all of that got me enough to be like, yeah, go Jorg, but also like go Jorg. No, man. Well, I I, I felt the same. I felt the same way as Steven. It's, it's almost to the point where I, I, I ask myself, why am I still cheering for Jork? Why do I want him mm-hmm. to win? And uh, I mean, the only real answer I could get is because I've walked in his shoes. I, I He's the person I know best. I, I hear his voice when I read it. There's, there's not really a strong inclination of this guy is going to be what's best for the world or this guy is going to I don't, I don't some some help out other people somehow by winning i mean he literally yeah. sets off a nuke in order to try and further he himself takes a, yeah he takes a city yeah. by completely nuking it well, not okay. that so, not that he understands all, the consequences I, I think that there's 
first of all, there's not like a strong person to root for instead of him. I mean, like none of the people that he's yeah. fighting against are particularly upstanding people either. Mm. I mean, he's just, so so I'm that, actually almost done with the second book. And so, okay, wait, <laughs> hold on. Oh, wow, gosh. Josh, Josh went from, <laughs> I almost didn't finish the first book to, Guys, I'm I'm basically done with the second book. <laughs> Spoiler alert! But but Ryan, Josh, will know what Josh I, know, re- I know what you're talking about, and I'm not talking about it yet because. So, <laughs> all right. Also, that was one of the things I missed. I completely missed the fact that this is like was nuclear fallout that he was messing with. Like, wh- how did that? How did you guys? How do you guys pick up on that? To me, it was just like. Dude, I he, also he didn't, reads when he's he reads with the book when, when he's, he's with. Reading, yeah, but it was, was with Sally. Is, the... but it was too busy thinking about Sally's curvaceousness. Yeah, to, uh... yeah. That's um. That, uh, these are things that I I picked up on a lot more on my second read through. They made a sense. They clicked a lot faster because I knew the background of the world, and that's something that you don't necessarily know when you're beginning the book. You don't know that it's post-apocalyptic world yeah i did not pick up on that in my mind it was just like oh probably because like i don't know in my mind it was just like oh here's a world that's like maybe like an alternate universe like had like and like stephen king's books right like okay it's gonna say jesus but not really it's like jesus yeah something. so, so did you and all the all the old philosophers and authors yeah. right so like kind of an alternate reality. There, i didn't realize Dana. Even, yeah and also, I think part of that was because, like, you had these like alien creatures. But apparently, that was if you've lived generations with nuclear fallout, that's a possibility. So, and I the mean, AI. Nec- necromancer is developing seems a little strange. I'll so, be honest. So it, it does. Wait, this wait, might be Steven. in the sec- This might be in the. Does it Ryan, talk about that? That playing Ryan's, with Ryan says thin, to wait. So the, the thi- there's like a quote. I think it's in the first book. Might be in the second book. It's not really a spoiler. It's just getting into this where it talks about how people played with like the the edge between consciousness and not consciousness and life and death. And I think that's like the like alluding to splitting the atom and like kind of uh, walking that line. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think I think the idea is when all the nukes were uh, went off, it like tore a hole in the fabric of like separating life and death and that's what allows necromancy to happen i think that's the lore that, that's that's kind of Is kind this... of correct okay okay well i have no idea about that so we're just going to steer clear i will wait until the second book yeah so right. um yeah i don't know i did not pick up and that was why i thought i skim read it because i had like no clue that it was uh like nuclear stuff going on there so <laughs> so let's get into the mary sue okay yes, yes that's a good one so part of it's it another, is because he was being problem. part of it was being was because he was being influenced and he had some like magical protection so mm-hmm. i think we can we can say like that okay that makes some sense part of it is because after he ate the the heart of the necromancer he got a little bit of, of magic there but the dude was like always able to get through every scrap with pretty minimal planning and a lot of luck. Like there were some times where I was like, I, I'm not even like really concerned that Jorg is going to come out of this fine because I, I just know he is somehow. Yeah. That's always the danger of a first person. Uh, point <laughs> that's, of view. that's also true. Yeah. You're like, well, I know he's reading it. Like he's written this. So I know yeah. he's alive somewhere. Yeah. But, but the thing is, is I feel like they have a plot convenience in here already with, there being necromanced and people that like they could have, you know, that be like a somewhat hinted at possibilities that maybe Jorg is being necromanced or something writing this, you know? So, like, anyway. Yeah. I will say like, whenever I have like, an, like sustained an injury, I always think about like reading fantasy books where I like, like three weeks ago, I sprained my ankle pretty badly during basketball. And uh-huh. like, I couldn't even drive home on it. Right. And so like, when I read about like, <laughs> characters like breaking multiple ribs yeah, and yeah like, you know like <laughs> dislocating an arm or something I'm like it's just not possible like maybe maybe you can like do stuff for like a few minutes before like while your adrenaline's still in and before shock kicks in but like even like with a sprained ankle like when i got home i was in so much pain that i started like going into like mini shock you know like i couldn't like even like function you know 
Um, so it's just like so outside the realm of possibility, you know. So if we're writing a fantasy novel, don't make you the protagonist because <laughs> yeah, I guess so. you're gonna have to be on the shelf every time you get injured. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like either I, you know, take a bunch of pain medication right after, or I'm just gonna have to like sit there and get <laughs> yeah, around. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. The other thing, my, my cats are going crazy. I'm sorry. <laughs> So, so the other thing, Stephen, you, you have all the, those caveats in there of like, why, okay, why it makes sense that he has all this plot armor and that he's a Mary Sue. But even uh-huh. the fact that somehow as a preteen, he has gotten this band of warriors around him just because he's so brutal, question mark? Like, uh, why? Why Corian, are these... man. Corian. But what, what's Corian? Corian's making all these people follow him. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, he's influencing Jorg's actions. Jorg has Macon and the Nubin, who are probably being influenced as well. And I think that certain members of the Brotherhood are on a short, short leash, like uh, Reich, who is very unpredictable. And has, I forget, has, has in this book, have they talked at all about Brother Price? Right, so he kills Brother Price, who's the huge one at right. the beginning. And, and he, with an incredibly lucky shot, right? It was, with, like a David, it was a David and Goliath type of He was in through the situation. eye and then through the throat and then yeah. bashes right. his head in. Yeah. And I, I think that that's the type of thing that's specifically, these are events that are being orchestrated by people who have powers that we don't fully understand. Okay, all right. <sighs> Yeah. Seems a little convenient for me. Seems well, like, well, it's, it's, I mean, it's just like with anything, like you can say, oh, like Ray is so awesome because this and that. When really it's just kind of some shortcuts taken to make the writing easier. And I think if you look at it OP. from, like if you put all the pieces together now, it makes some sense. I think I think it works out okay. But when, you, when you're reading it and you come into it at the beginning, and you don't really get those explanations it's like okay jorg is this young kid and he's leading this brutal band of warriors like right away you're like what is this like this doesn't it yeah. doesn't really add up and so maybe that feeling of just the kind of this discontent here lingers even after you get some explanation i've kind of wondered why this isn't a tv show because i feel like in a lot of ways this was written to be picked up as a tv show you know what i mean and you think i think it become less believable that's what I'm saying. I think it might be okay. because it would so, look so ridiculous. Like they would either have to age Jorg up a lot or it would just look so ridiculous to have like a 12 to 14 year old girl or boy leading all these, uh, these battle hardened men around, you know? And, and it doesn't necessarily start as that. Remember it, it does start with Jorg just, just kind of following around them around and they tolerate him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he brings him out of prison too, right? Right, right. And anyway. on looking back, we know that Corian was responsible for getting them to prison in the first place. And so maybe that was... Corian or Sages? Oh, Sages. Yeah. That's another but, character that's a big question mark for me. But weren't they... Corian and Sages are working together, right? No, no. They're, they're, they're opposed. Oh, my bad. Because there's a time where Sage just comes to him and he's like, hey, I can remove this block and give you free will back. And Jorg's like, I have free will. What are you talking about? And Sage just is kind of, just kind of like, okay, if, I, if I'm remembering right. So Sage is still around, but they seem to be of the same flavor of mage or yeah. pagan or whatever they are. Yeah. Okay, Ryan, um, did you think Jorg was a Mary Sue? You're okay with it? Yeah, so I, I, th- I think the way that I explained it makes me okay with it. I, I, I definitely do get feelings, as, even when I was rereading it, of it's not super believable that this, this 13-year-old kid is leading these murderers, rapists who lack morality and would do them away without any other thought, except when you, you say that Corian is influencing him. But then I also felt the same way at the end where Jorg literally in the tournament, he, he kind of, he 
just wins his way over to uh-huh. Corian, and then he's able to to just kill his way and uh gorgoth holds open the gate and it, so everything goes his way when he's taking renar and right. you can't accri- attribute that to Corian. so i i do think that the argument of of him being a Mary Sue has validity. And I, I don't think you can explain it all away with just saying, oh, Corian was helping him. Yeah, the horse kick was very fortuitous. He was able to get the dagger out in front of him enough to stab Corian. And yeah, the extent of his plan was like, oh, he, you guys hold the gate open and I'll, I'll pretend to be Sir Elaine and, and kill everyone at the melee. Like, that's not a good plan. <laughs> But I guess it worked. It, it was an exciting plan to read. Certainly, was, but... That was a cool part. That was a very exciting part. Oh, yes. I loved it. But However, at, looking back, you're like, this should not have worked. Well, and I didn't realize that that was going to be the climax of the book. Yeah. So, you know so what I mean? Those scenes kind of remind me of Red Rising a little bit where I could see. Yeah, that's the plan. But I guess yeah. we're going with it. <laughs> All right. So we've covered a lot of different things. Let's do worst to the best. If you had one more thing that you want to if you want to throw out there now is the time so this is the segment where we talk about something we really liked but like man one thing about it that was kind of weird so we're going to give josh one more opportunity to to nitpick at the book it sounds like um all right who wants to go first i am totally unprepared for this part so i need to think a little bit okay you can uh you can come up with one on the fly like me where i kind of invent one it doesn't really work but i'm able to talk my right. way into something <laughs> I, I got i got one okay and Josh. that and that is <laughs> the, the kind of like the this the sci-fi slash post-apocalyptic parts of the book were one of my favorite aspects of the book but they just did not uh i felt like they needed to be either incorporated sooner or more or done to greater extent like you got kind of like the AI type thing that needed to be mm-hmm. shut off. Like it just wanted, they were like, Oh, we can release you. And he's like, no, I just want to be shut off. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that's a really cool thought. And Ben's uh, description of the author being a PhD in math. Like I, I feel like that's a really interesting thing f- to think about. And it's just kind of thrown in there. And I get that this is a short book and, but I feel like that stuff like that, is I really like, and I wish that they would have focused on a little bit more. Instead, it just seemed a little bit distracting. Cool backstory to the world, but ultimately no real ramifications for the plot events that we care about. Yeah, besides him just nuking a city. Yeah, there was that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, should I throw one out there? Yeah. Okay, um, kind of along the same part of the book, the whole nuking of the city, right? Like getting into the nukes that was cool um how they didn't even realize what they were and he almost basically destroyed the entire world that was um funny i don't know it was it was interesting and i'm glad it didn't happen but the whole thing with the necromancers and the lacrosia i thought it just kind of came out of nowhere and again this is maybe the same type of criticism interesting like okay we've got this really more magical thing that's happening in this previous in this world that was previously just very gritty but didn't have a ton of magic in it now okay we've got all this magic but then this again is not super important for any plot events that we care about later in the book so i guess i'm saying that i hope both of these things are more important later in the series so i'm going to say that was a good one steven that was going to be the one i chose but i came up with a backup just in case (laughs) um the way that he uh kind of took control of the I don't know, the forest rangers? What what were the people that his father gave him to go help attack the, the city? The forest watch, I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the forest watch. And like, so it was crazy to see him, we kind of get got like a picture of how he would have like kind of rallied his band of murders together. Like he like, you know, went to the leader and just checked him off the waterfall and like gave the yeah. grant <laughs> second like person just like, no, you're the forest uh-huh. watch. Uh-huh. So, um, but then, like, I was expecting something more to happen with the Forest Watch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although it was pretty funny when he was like, we accrued a lot of casualties and he just like, pissed off two people. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, one of them. Yeah, one of them might kill. Yeah. Uh, and then one of them died playing cards. <laughs> yeah. And then but he holds I, up the dust and he's like, okay, here's a. Uh, Sir, what's its name from Galleth? And he lets some of the dust go and he's like, here's all the other citizens. Yeah. 
yeah uh -huh. but i i would have wished that like something else would have happened like he would have incorporated them maybe like into like his plan to storm like the castle at the end or something i don't know just i mean he like does that. a little bit like they're they're kind of the same way as yeah. a distraction but yeah so i don't know it was a cool scene but just lacked any any kind of tying together so I think I would probably have to go with uh, Jorg and Catherine's relationship. Right. It's I personally like the relationship and it, it's an interesting motivator for Jorg in, in different ways where he doesn't really care what anybody thinks of him. But then at the same time, you can kind of tell that he wants Catherine to like him back even if he's not necessarily willing to admit it to himself and mm -hmm. I, I think the worst part of it is just that there isn't really any I, I guess I gave I, I gave the in the beginning my own theory that uh, where, where Jorg is almost seeking to fill the the void that that is left in his life by the death of his mother. The fact that he has no uh, moral authority with Catherine, yeah. but that's not explicitly stated in this book. And so it's not super reasonable to me. It, it, there's no reasonable reason for these two people to just be so their fates to be so intertwined. Yeah. It definitely felt like the, like there was a lot of things, including that that was kind of thrown in there for the trilogy to work, you know, like, so that this relationship didn't mm -hmm. just like come out of nowhere in the second book. That's yeah. how I thought. And that's not having read any of the other books, but. I think all four of our worst of the best kind of touched on that theme. Yeah. So, so one thing I will give credit to this book for, and I, I've never really pondered on like the horrors of like a nuclear bomb before. Like, I feel like it, when it was taught in, in high school, it was just like, oh yeah, we need to end world war two. So we dropped, we dropped the bomb and it was probably a really, you know, hard decision, but like nuclear bombs killed like 200,000 people. Yeah. You should read Can the you, Poppy War. Yeah, well, yeah. I, yeah. That's, that's another book, but I feel like for whatever reason, this just like kind of viscerally got me when like, it's just like, here's the dust of this whole city. And especially with like, I don't know how much you guys followed like the, the battle, like the stuff going on between like Israel and Hamas right now. And I don't want to get like political, but it's like, you know, it's like citizens are being targeted and you have like a few, like count on one hand, number of civilian casualties in these like conflicts, right? You know, and uh -huh. it's like a huge war crime. But like 60 years ago, we killed like 200,000 civilians. And I feel like this book has really got me to like kind of wrestle with that. And I don't want to like get into like the politics or like be critical of that decision, but it's actually made me think a lot more about it recently than like mm -hmm. I have before in my life. So I think that, you know, his credit to this book. Dang, well, call me a psychopath because I haven't thought twice about the people of Galath after you blow them up. <laughs> well, I don't, yeah, okay. I, I don't know. It, it wasn't like this did like a treatise on like the ethics of, you know, nuclear war. Or anything, okay, tell me about the, did the bomb actually go off the city or did he just like open up the reactor? He I'm very like, so I, from my limited understanding of physics, I think that there i mean there's the smaller bombs that we dropped on uh hiroshima and nagasaki and then there's larger nuclear bombs like that are hydrogen bombs and uh, i think in order you have a bigger explosion but it's triggered by a smaller expo explosion which is basically uh like the smaller bombs that we dropped they kind of trigger a bigger explosion okay and but so like in the book what happened yes there, there's a, so yeah. i'm i'm saying that the all that's left is like the smaller nuclear bomb that triggers the bigger bomb but how did they explode it like did they oh they left somebody behind or they, they did you know a fuse but that was i don't know that was... <laughs> they exploded yeah. it they ran i'm, they ran I'm like probably heck. totally wrong they, they and... exploded it it's clarified ryan i don't know if you it's clarified in the second book that they the bomb went boom but didn't they like choose he like had to choose how much to blow up or something like right that. so yeah. did they just carry the rest mm -hmm. of the reactor out or I, I don't know 
I mean, they didn't really know what it was. George didn't really care to yeah. give us the details of what exactly they were dealing with. Maybe I we should just, like, try was, like, and ask. About the box, and then I bet. Would... I bet if you tweeted Mark Lawrence on Twitter, he'd probably give you an explanation concerning oh, his his background. I'm sure it has mm. a totally logical explanation that none of us know enough about physics I mean, to understand. A 13 year old prodigy could figure it out by reading a. Well, he does know a lot. The behind of a prostitute so that uh yeah. so you do remember where it was <laughs> <laughs> he was a little bit distracted <laughs> yeah it was like ooh. all right all right prince of thorns by mark right. lawrence so josh is almost done with king of thorns sounds like ben and i need to catch up right are you you're gonna reread all of them or what are you doing uh well i i re- reread the prince of thorn the broken empire trilogy and then today oh, i yeah, actually just finished the follow-up trilogy which starts with prince of fools and that's red, we... is that red queen's war that is red queen's war and like i mentioned it's takes place around the same time and the main character of that trilogy actually runs into jorg at least a few times so should, should we do some quick ratings all right, yeah. ratings for Prince of Thorns. I should just yeah. wanting to get a nephew, Josh, for that. What, what, what is what is this rating system? Is it like S A B C? Out of ten. Out of ten. Completely arbitrary. Yeah. I'm gonna say eight point five. I'm nice. giving it. A, I'm giving it an eight out of ten. I uh, I really liked it. It was very engaging. I mean, we've pointed out maybe some shortcomings, but I binged it. I liked it. I'm going to do a 7.25. So I thought you had 7.5 on my last one. So. <laughs> I'm giving it a 6. Ooh, a right. solid 6. All right. Is the, is I the next just one, wanted to do a throw out of the 6. Is book 2 better for you, Josh? Let's yes. at least get that. Yeah. Do you do like book 2 better? I think that the, they get better and better. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, okay. I've, uh, book 2 fixes a lot of the problems I had in book 1. Not okay. all of them, but a lot of them. Looking forward to that. I'm, okay, so I'm going to start that now. I'm, okay, now, now I Do can it. go. Do it. All right, thanks for tuning in. If you want to see more from Phantology, hear more from Phantology, you can find our full catalog at www.phantologybooks.com. Uh, I've covered most of the series we talked about, at least in this episode, as well as some of Sanderson stuff, Wheel of Time stuff, like most of the big names in fantasy. We, we've at least talked about them. Um, Mark Lawrence, I guess we've been a little late in getting to, but we're excited to cover more. And if you want to chat with us, you can hop on our Discord. Invites will be in the episode description. We have a growing community there that is always happy to talk about uh, really anything fantasy books. And we have uh, uh, we have a blogger on there, Shauna Lawless, who's reading the books right now and giving her reviews. So uh, there is a captive audience there for your Mark Lawrence reviews. <laughs> So hop she on actually there and talk just she actually just got a book deal today, right? Yeah, congrats. Yeah. So, yeah, so we have we have famous people on Discord. Yeah, she's an aspiring author that has made it. So there's a lot of cool people that you can catch up with. I mean, besides myself on the Discord. <laughs> that goes without saying. <laughs> All right, see you guys. All right, see you. Thanks, Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Phantology. If you'd like to let us know your opinions on all things sci-fi and fantasy, join our Discord. Invites are in the episode descriptions below. If you'd like to support the show, like these fine folks here, you can do that at patreon.com slash phantology underscore books. Patrons get early access to new episodes, exclusive postings, and exclusive Discord benefits. But of course, just listening and watching and sharing with your friends and family is support enough. Journey before destination all. 